with sustainability. And I thought I'd start off by talking about my story, my sort of long emotional story when I finally came around after years and decades of not being sustainable to being somebody who was sustainable. And so, clicker, yeah. This is my story and it is from California. It's around 2007 and one day I met a really hot British girl and that is my story. That is my story. I met a really hot British girl who had an even hotter accent somehow and she was really sustainable. And the next day, I was sustainable. On the first time I brought her to my house, um, she comes over and she finishes her drink. And she's like, oh, where's the recycling? And I was like, oh, um, um. And I had a box, thankfully, that was a cardboard box with a bunch of papers that I was reading. And I was like, it's that cardboard box over there. And the whole night, I was just like grabbing Diet Cokes from the regular trash and throwing it in there. And that's how I became sustainable. Um, uh, in a similar way, um, how I became an organ donor is I always thought organ donation was for those weird people in Venice and stuff, those weird people. A, a, a good, smart person would never be an organ donor. That was not expected of me. And then my little brother turned out to be an organ donor, and I'm like, I'm better, or I'm at least as good as my little brother, and the next day, I was an organ donor. And so this is my story, but I think this is also pretty much all our own stories to some degree, is that we all have a story that's more about emotion. It's more about social things. It's more about psychology than it was about information. Right, so I don't know what your story is. I don't know exactly, but I can tell you what your story not is. And what not your story is, is what I like to call the pamphlet story. No, none of you were walking down New York somewhere and then out of the corner somewhere, you were ambushed by a Greenpeace member with dirty dreadlocks and a dirty shirt, and they handed you a pamphlet. And you opened up the pamphlet, and it had a bunch of information, and of course, a really nice, huge side helping of heavy-handed guilt. And you looked at it and you said, oh my gosh, I have been terrible my entire life, flip, Oh my gosh, I've been killing so many polar bears. I have so much Arctic blood on my hand. Flip, oh my gosh, I have been so inefficient. That's not how it happened. That doesn't ever exist. And so, why do we keep using strategies like this? Why do we keep this information, this education only strategy? You know, I sometimes slip into it still myself, and I think the reason we do is it's because we, it's easy and we don't think of the other strategies. So what other strategies work? And that's what we're here to talk about. So, so what actually works? So what actually works is one thing that I talked about is peer influence. Because the greatest influence on people is other people, specifically their peers, people that are close to them. This can be a personal, like my brother or the British girl that I was trying to make personal. It can be a work community relationship or it can be an organizational thing. And the problem is um, that we sort of understand how peer influence is by seeing the negative side, right? we know that there's sort of this idea that nobody is out there on the street being sustainable. And what this is is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Nobody else is joining out there because we don't see other people doing it. And unfortunately, environmental advertising often does this. It says, please be environmental because no one else is being environmental. And research shows that this not only is ineffective, but is counterproductive and backfires and reduces people's environmental intentions and behaviors. So whenever you're talking about environmentalism, whenever you're talking about sustainability, whatever form you're doing in the green area, in the sustainable area, you need to talk about how everyone else is doing it. And that should be one of your first points in any argument or any communication you're making to other people. And why peer influence works is because it works under this, persuasion, this persuasive power that we're gonna be talking about, which is the power of doable and desirable. Peer influence says this is a doable thing. It's safe, accomplishable, and a well-trodden path because other people have done it, and it's a desirable thing. It's a positive thing, and it's what you should be expected to do. And lots of times, people aren't trying to figure out what is the exact right, perfectly rational thing to do. They're trying to think what should they do that is most expected for them morally, socially, or economically. So we all know this story, uh, Office of One, a memoir. We wrote it, most of us, right? Um, it's the story by the sustainability manager, and it goes a little bit like this. So there was an event or a series of events, maybe it was someone's bright idea, maybe it was a rating system that you didn't do so well on, um, maybe it was peer pressure from an organization, and there was a lot of energy and engagement around that idea, and someone got this bright idea, let's establish an office for sustainability and or a, a sustainability position. And then everybody's like, Okay, do a little bit of back padding, and we're 
on our way, right? Because that person can just take a care of responsibility for themselves, right? Wrong, right? We know that this does not work. Um, if sustainability, um, true sustainability, I think, is all about integration, right? My dream for every office that I've ever worked at, every organization I've ever worked for, is that every single person that I see when I walk, or every person that I see, I ask them, so whose job is sustainability? And they all say, it's my job, right? We all have to internalize and have a sense of belonging and identity around sustainability. So not only, as Troy says, does the science say peer influence works, we actually need it, right? We need the help. We can't be an office of one. So where can it work? In my experience, it can work at all levels of the hierarchy, right? From executive leadership all the way down to the grassroots, um, peer influence really has a role to play. So we need to think about mapping our organizations. Where are our assets? Who are our allies? Where do we not have allies? Um, and then how do we create programs to expand that network? So here are just a couple of strategies um, for peer influence. One is mentorship programs, so really giving folks the opportunity to speak to each other one-on-one -on -one and share strategies. Uh, learning communities, so when we're in a space where we all are sitting and learning about something together, we're probably more receptive to those new ideas if we feel like our partner is also gonna be doing that. Um, green teams, which tend to be very place-based oriented. Um, and folks can collaborate around how sustainability really fits into their job function. So the sort of peer influence 2.0 piece is I think where you get to kind of mix it up. So um, I know most of us work in pretty hierarchical organizations. I work in higher ed. It is as hierarchical as it gets, even though we talk about not doing that. Um, and these kinds of peer influence structures really work well in their second iteration when we have folks in executive leadership working with folks at the grassroots level. Um, and then thinking intra as well as inter-organizationally. So how can we serve as mentors to other organizations, so in my case other universities, and how can we learn from our peers at that organizational level as well? So I wanted to tell another personal story, and this one is a little bit more serious this time for real. It is, um, it's one day, uh, it's back in the day, I'm 14, I'm in a doctor's office, and I'm staring out a window at a beautiful, perfect California day. Nothing could be more paradise, especially to me as a Californian, but I'm not enjoying this because right here on the other side is my doctor telling me that I'm diagnosed with hypoglycemia. And this means, this explains why I've been depressed lately, and why I'm at pretty severe risk for future health problems. And immediately I deny this. But I don't deny it because I'm, you know, I'm denying my current depression. I know that, I'm kind of okay with it, I'm a teenager, I kind of think that's cool for some reason. Um, and it's not because of these future health reasons. It's because of what's on this board. Is that I knew that I would have to give up one of the things that I valued most as a 14 year old boy which was caramel frappuccinos from Starbucks. I did not have a lot going on in my life when I was 14. It was a long time before those British girls started entering my life. The only British girl in my life at that time was Hermione from Harry Potter. And um, if he'd have taken Harry Potter away, he'd taken everything away from me. Um, and the point what I was doing here is I was engaging in something called solution aversion. So this is a term that um, my colleague Aaron Kay from Duke University and I have uh, coined, and it's the idea that normally we think people deny problems because they're denying the problem. Like I'm denying my health problem because of the future health risks. I'm design, denying um, an environmental problem because it's, it's apocalyptic. I'm denying the inefficiencies of my company because it's really bad and for this company. But really actually what happens is in addition to these things or even in place of these, what we're usually denying these problems or dismissing these problems is because we don't like the solution. We don't want to go through all the steps to get there. They seem very undesirable to fix this company. It seems like the solution to anything in environmental will be a severe personal or societal solution. And for me, with um, my hypoglycemia, that it means I have to give up uh, frappuccinos. And so what you have to do with people is you have to find their frappuccino. Um, so my doctor explained to me that, you know, uh, other people have this and they have diets where they get to actually eat a frappuccino every time, so the solution's not so bad. 
And so what you have to do with people is, again, find their Frappuccino. And I can't tell you exactly what everybody else's Frappuccino is, but what it is, is it's something in front of their mind. And it's stopping them from thinking about anything else. And if you don't remove this, then you don't get anywhere. So some Frappuccinos, as we know, are the dollar sign. You have to make it pro profit positive, talk in ROI language. We've talked a lot about that today. Present bias, concrete, doable steps. You know, you can be promising me that this is profit positive, but all I'm thinking as you're saying this is, what do I have to do, what do I have to do, what do I have to do? And if you can't make that doable and desirable for me, I'm gonna dismiss, I'm gonna deny. Now the one thing that I wanna add, because I don't think it was talked a, a lot about today, is this psychological idea that people are present biased. We care about tomorrow 500,000 times more than we care about five or 10 years from now. This is an unfortunate thing for us in sustainability because most of the benefits from sustainability are long term. However, we have to deal with this problem of people who are present biased. You probably all have coworkers or bosses, probably many of them, who are insanely present biased. And that psychology about them is not going to change. You're not going to turn them into a rational, expected utility, long-term person. They're gonna always be present biased because that's the natural state of humanity. And so you have to deal with that present bias. So whenever you're communicating your goods, now you guys as really, really hypersensitive business people, you think in long term. But most people are thinking in the short term. So you have to talk about how that's beneficial in the short term. You're gonna be more efficient tomorrow. You're going to, or at least this year, we're gonna get good press. We're gonna get this certification. We get to join this group. I don't know, maybe a British girl will like us. Whatever it is, that's what you have to hit because people are present bias as hell. So as Troy is talking about, how do we make it um, doable? We need to create as many pathways as possible to getting there, right? So um, whether we're talking about partner events, one-time theme programs, competitions, or tiered certification systems, these are all different ways that we can kind of get people in the door. And you'll notice that from partner events up to tiered certification systems, there's sort of an ease curve, right? So we want to provide people lots of different levels of entry points as well. Um, so maybe with partner events, you're finding a popular partner um, who can help increase your exposure um, among an ally that you'd like to, or among someone that you'd like to make an ally. With competitions, maybe you're, increase, you're creating um, energy and water competitions between groups within your organizations. Um, another huge trend, which I'm sure most of you know a ton about, is gaming. Um, so individual or team gaming situations where folks are essentially adopting sustainable behaviors either in the office um, and or at home. Um, and uh, competitions, or excuse me, certification systems are a huge um, potential way to get folks engaged. And I like to think about them um, as tiered. So you want to provide them that first level entry point that's very easy um, to engage to. Um, that allows them to stay engaged as they, as they adopt new and more rigorous sustainability behaviors. There's a clear path, as Troy was saying, to um, them becoming more sustainable. Um, and then you can engage those certification populations in improving the actual certification system, in influencing peers, as we were talking about before, to join the, the certification system. Um, so um, the other thing that we want to do is um, make this desirable. And one of the ways that we can do that is create a hero narrative. Um, I was born in 1982. That means I'm the oldest form of um, the phenomena we call uh, millennial, which we'll learn about next. Um, and that means I know who that is, Captain Planet. Huge motivator for me from an environmental standpoint when I was young. Um, so we want to create an, a, a sustainability hero narrative um, that's not only for individuals, but it's for groups, it's for big actions, it's for small actions, um, and it consistently says things like, you are special and important, you belong to this group, your work is critical to the organization, um, and the work that you do benefits you personally. So that means understanding what their Frappuccino is and reconstructing your program around it. We're doing great on time. Um, so we talked about solution aversion, and uh, the things that we really talked about solution aversion were more about personal things. But as we all know, potentially the largest source of solution aversion comes from what's about to make this presentation a little more controversial, ideology. 
And so researchers like myself and um, pretty much all the main universities uh, almost in the world now have looked at different ways in which ideology really, really triggers solution aversion and is one of the main reasons that people are likely to deny or dismiss or kind of be hesitant towards anything related to sustainability, green, environment, climate. And one of the reasons we know is because some of these solutions are simply antithetical to people's ideologies. An ideology is a massive frappuccino in front of people's minds. It is incredibly, incredibly important to some people. People are ideologues. People don't want to cross party lines. This thing right here is who they are. I think a lot of people in here um, are very interested in cross communication. We're sort of not entrenched in an ideology. We're very multi ideology. But tons and tons of people have a single frappuccino that sits in front of their head in their single ideology. And so some of these solutions, as we know, that are the most talked about when we get anywhere in the environmental spectrum, big government, sacrifice, almost phrased in a communistic way, and taxes. And we all know that these things seem to be more antithetical to a specific ideology, which is a more conservative ideology. And what this probably means is that anybody who's a little bit conservative in here has probably gotten really, really good at talking to other conservatives. And we're all a little bit businessy, so we're all probably getting better and better at talking to this. And we've all sort of learned that, you know, you don't talk about these things so much. And when you can, you show other people, show people solutions that are consistent with their ideology and are, or reframe things that actually exist. So you talk about pro-economy solutions, how free markets can be used or managed to accomplish these things. You don't talk about sacrifice, you talk about innovation and growth. Don't talk about sacrifice. And you don't talk about taxes, you try not even to use the word taxes because that's a trigger word for lots of people, so you talk about things like offset and even though it's a tax, you don't say it. And, or if you do say it, you talk about how taxes are used to make markets efficient. And reframing and changing solutions around ideologies is very complicated. It can work sometimes, it can work Work, uh, it can work sometimes, it can uh, not work at other times. And we have to be honest and we shouldn't change a solution to an inferior solution, the, uh, incredibly inferior solution just to serve somebody's ideology or reduce ideological threat. But there are so many opportunities with people's different you know, ideologies that we need to manage and we need to be better at communicating. And this leads me to, um, uh, actually let me just say, I give this talk a lot of times, a lot of times. Most of the time my audience is about 97% liberal. It's an academic audience, hyper liberal. And what happens is, as I talk about these things and I give these examples of solution aversion, the liberals in my audience just eat it up. They just eat it up because what I'm saying is conservatives are denying something on average more than liberals. And the liberals are like, oh yeah, I'm so much better, I'm so much better. And I just let them eat it up. Sometimes I'll stick in an example where I have other studies that show that liberals are likely to be the ones that are biased in the situations because it's more ideologically threatening to them. But most of the time I just, I just um, let them eat it up. And then I have some, and then I wait for the Q&A. And then I have some, somebody raises their hand and they're like, oh, I'm gonna ask this question in front of all these liberals. There's this liberal from California on the stage. We're gonna have this talk about how much conservatives suck. And then I throw a curveball at them and I say, oh, yeah, that's, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, that's what I just said up here, that the ideological bias um, doesn't make them bad people. But let me ask you a question. What are you doing to better communicate because of this problem? Because I think probably the thing that you're doing is posting on Twitter and Facebook, conservatives suck. And even if the Huffington Post salon headline didn't say that explicitly, you added that as a tag under your tweet, didn't you? And Yes, conservatives may be on average more resistant to these things, but just so you know, lots of them aren't. But that doesn't mean you're right. You're wrong because you see a problem and you're not doing anything to actually solve it. And so I think what we need to do with ideology is recognize that this is a huge frappuccino. It's a complicated one, but we cannot ignore it. We can't dismiss it. We have to face it in whatever way we can. And that's going to be very different by your different situations, but it is incredibly important to keep in your mind. You have lots of time. 
So I think what's really critical here is thinking about how these threats can really become opportunities. And that requires us to think really critically about our language and the language that we've used. And uh, I'm not as far along with this as I would have liked, and certainly I'm not as well versed in the science as Troy is. Um, but as I'm, I'm more reflective about it myself, I've tried to think of ways that I've used language that has actually um, alienated people from understanding where I'm coming from. Because I think nine times out of 10 when you sit down at a table with someone and you start talking to them about what really matters to them, we actually share a lot more values than, um, than, than not. Um, and the thing that we don't share is the language for explaining what our values are. So what if national security or social justice or support for local economies, um, what if that conversation about those values really was just a conversation about sustainability, but we didn't call it a sustainability conversation? We didn't call it a green conversation. Would we get to the same endpoint? I think ultimately we probably would. Um, so I'm gonna tell, um, give a really quick example. Um, this is a project called the National Strategic Narrative. It's uh, a project led by uh, Mark Puck Mickleby, and he is the, or he's, he was before um, uh, the special strategic assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is probably the coolest job title I've ever heard. Um, but the whole report really um, uh, hinges on this idea that the most critical threat to national security and really um, the biggest domestic policy issue is uh, our country's slow progress towards sustainability. Um, and that this, that we really, um, as a people, need to develop a new grand strategy that moves away from Cold Era or Cold War Era containment toward um, a sustainable future. But the really brilliant thing that he does, and he works with these incredible groups of um, cross-sector stakeholders, um, folks from universities, folks from lo local and national businesses, um, folks from government, um, is, is they talk quite a bit about what I would consider sustainability initiatives, but they don't call it that. They call them walkable community initiatives. They call it regenerative agriculture. They call it um, resource productivity. And it's a really fascinating and brilliant way to frame out the issues um, while bringing new people into the conversation about how we can move forward. So al along this line is that, you know, of that Greenpeace advocate who you are always pretending to be on a phone when you're walking past them, that brochure uses a strategy that's almost the opposite of this. It uses a strategy that says, you are incredibly wrong. You are not environmental. You don't have the right values. And no one ever wants to hear that because no one ever wants to opt into a moral system where they are already at the bottom. And so what lots and lots of people are do, especially a lot of my liberal friends from California, is they love saying, you're wrong, I'm right, here's how to be like me. But really kind of what we want to do a lot of time is to say, you're already right. You already have these really great values, and here's how you can even be more right. And that's what things like this does, and that's another way to head on ideology. Instead of just trying to fix it, you're really showing people how their ideology is their current ideologies are compatible with the approach of sustainability. And so I just wanted to say one thing um, before we go, and I wanted to uh, talk one more time about the fact that I had hypoglycemia and that I was 14 years old and I was severely depressed and I was at severe health risk. I was eating a Frappuccino every day, or more than one, and it was not going in a good place. And the health of my body was actually not unlike the health of this planet. It was at a severe risk for future problems. It was not unlike the health of an unsustainable company. And what made my doctor so amazing is his combination of policy and psychology. Because on one hand, my doctor 
diagnosed me with the problem. He was the first one who got the science right about what was wrong with me, and the first one to show me what the solutions or the policy that I could enact, and if I enacted it, I would get better. And this is really what all the talks today have been about. For the most part, we've been talking about what is the right policy and science if enacted would solve the problem. But what makes my doctor truly amazing is that on the other hand, he understood my solution aversion, the frappuccinos of my mind, and the, my psychological resistance. And he not only diagnosed me, he got me to diagnose myself. And that made all the difference. This combination made all the difference for a depressed health problem 14-year-old. And this is the same combination that I think can make all the difference for the future of sustainability. So thank you very much.